let me introduce our speaker today. Uh, we're really happy to have Badra Abdullah with us. And uh, he's a third year PhD student at Saarland University. I probably mispronounced that, apologies. Um, and uh, uh, I, will, I will quote directly from your bio so that I don't misrepresent anything. So uh, his main research interest is studying the impact of linguistic experience on speech processing using computational models. And he's currently developing a cognitively motivated analysis framework to investigate the extent to which neural networks for speech can predict the fac facilitatory effect of language similarity on cross-lingual cross-language speech processing tasks. And this all sounds super interesting and I'm really excited to hear more in your talk, which is titled Capturing Cross-Linguistic Similarity with Speech Representation Learning. Um, so take it away, Badr. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure today uh, for me to be here and present um, my work on capturing cross-linguistic similarity uh, with speech representation learning. So as Maria has said, my name is Badr Abdullah. I'm a PhD student at the Language Science and Technology Department at Zarland University. Um, so most of this talk is going to be about cross-linguistic similarity. So I thought it would, be, um, it would be informative to just talk a little bit about the different perspectives uh, that we could look at language similarity. Um, and um, so that's because we have different perspectives where we can, uh, where we can answer the question, uh, what does it mean for two languages to be similar? And the first, the first perspective is the typological perspective, uh, which mainly concerned with language uh, structure. So the question becomes how much, how much linguistic structure is shared between language A and language B across different levels of the um, linguistic hierarchy. So, um, and Languages can share linguistic structures for different reasons. Um, and some of them are historical um, reasons, such as the genetic relations. So um, when, when we say that Russian and Ukrainian are, are similar, that's because they are both, West, uh, they are both East uh, Slavic languages that have uh, diverged from, from Proto-Slavic. So they have inherited most of their temporal Type, typological features from Proto-Slavic. Um, but that's not the only, uh, that's not the only historical reason why two languages might end up being similar. Uh, the other uh, reason has to do with language contact. So uh, when we look at the languages of India, um, so we can kind of like, there are two main um, there are two main groups of languages, the Indo-Aryan languages and the Dravidian languages. And uh, there are a lot of typological features in the, in the Indo-Aryan languages that are quite rare in the other Indo-European languages. So it seems that these features have transferred from the, from the Dravidian languages uh, because of the language contact and the fact that the speaker communities are geographically nearby. So this is another um, kind of like historical factor why two languages might end up being similar. Uh, but languages can be similar actually for non-historical reasons uh, because um, all human languages um, kind of like have evolved under the same cognitive constraints and all um, humans have, um, I guess, similar vocal tract. And so some of the typological features of the languages could be just language, uh, could be just language un um, universals. And also, uh, it could also happen that languages end up being similar by chance because the dimensions by or in which languages might vary is a finite set. So it's also likely that two languages end up being similar due to chance. Um, but that's not the only perspective uh, from which we can look at language similarity. Uh, the other perspective is the sociolinguistic perspective, which is more a communication centric perspective. And the question here becomes, to what extent would a native speaker of language A understand language B? And uh, this question actually offers us um, another way at uh, quantifying language similarity because we can do some kind of like experimental studies and tests on mutual intelligibility. Um, so this question is mainly concerned, uh, for example, if we have a French tourist 
that goes to Italy and then maybe they go to a restaurant and then the waiter at the Italian restaurant starts talking to them in Italian. The question becomes how much Italian could this French tourist understand? So here the main, uh, the main emphasis on the cross language speech communication aspects. Um, and um, this aspect of mutual intelligibility um, is affected by different factors. Some of them are linguistic factors, which has, which has to do with uh, the, the cross linguistic similarity between the languages, but also um, it, it also has to do with uh, within language variation. So if that French tourist is kind of like familiar with a lot of French dialects, this will make them more um, um, capable of decoding spe uh, speech in other uh, related languages. Uh, but it's also affected by extra li linguistic factors such as the language exposure. Um, so if that, if that French uh, tourist uh, maybe watches a lot of Italian TV, of course this would improve their ability to understand Italian, even though if they don't actually speak Italian uh, pro pro uh, in like they cannot actually produce Italian. And the, the last factor has to do with the listener's attitude. Uh, of course, if the listener has a positive attitude uh, towards communicating in a, in a different language, this would enhance their ability to at least to, uh, to try to make sense of what's being said. And most of the work in social linguistic research is concerned with quantifying the language similarity uh, from the, uh, or is trying to focus on the linguistic aspects um, by which uh, the mutual intelligibility is affected. Nevertheless, it's, it actually remains very hard to isolate these factors from the extra linguistic factors because nowadays it's almost impossible to, um, to find this unbiased monolingual speaker who's not exposed to the other languages. And this is why also computational work could actually help in this to kind of like simulate listeners that are only exposed to a single language. Um, and on the other hand, this talk is about speech representation learning. And by this, I mean that uh, with deep learning and neural networks, now we can get actually vector representations uh, of speech stimuli. And this is really cool. And um, deep neural networks nowadays are everywhere and they support many speech technology applications. Um, and they make it possible to train end-to-end -end systems with actual acoustic realization of speech. So they offer a very promising framework for modeling human speech perception. And we could look at many interesting uh, questions that, uh, that we could actually address with modeling work using deep neural, deep neural networks. Um, some of these questions include, for, for example, um, uh, what can be learned from the speech signal alone from the spoken form? Um, or why do phonetic categories emerge um, in the like when when uh, when uh, when people learn uh, uh, languages? Or uh, what kind of uh, what kind of phonological abstractions do these neural networks learn? How, however, uh, we still actually don't understand much about how neural networks work. Uh, therefore, we would need to do like further kind of analysis uh, to look at their emergent. Uh, our representations. Um, so the main question that I would like to address in this talk is, is about how, uh, how do neural networks perceive cross-linguistic uh, cross li cross similarity and variation in speech? Uh, do they actually capture cross-linguistic similarity in a way that corresponds to our linguistic intuitions? Or maybe do they provide an alternative view to cross-linguistic variation that might be also interesting for us to look at? So uh, this talk is, uh, is uh, structured in four parts. Uh, I will, in part two and part three, I'll present two case studies uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we have done. And in the last part, I'll talk about some, uh, some challenges and future directions. Uh, was this the end of part one? Yes. Are you ready to take questions? Yes. Um, I actually have some questions, but if anyone, uh, if anyone else has any, please uh, feel free to go first. Uh, you can raise your hand or unmute yourself uh, and talk. And I will also um, 
I will also post a rocket chat link in the chat so you can uh, share the questions there. Um, if no one else is volunteering, I guess I'll start. Uh, this was very interesting. I've actually never thought about the sociolinguistic factors in mutual intelligibility, especially a listener's attitude was kind of a new thing to me for, for me to think about. I'm kind of curious, so I don't know if this is exactly relevant to what you do, but I feel like we have this uh, very strong cognitive bias when, uh, when we hear a language that we don't know, it kind of feels like we maybe sometimes hear words in our own language, or for example, anything that sounds even remotely like my name, I'm very attuned to that, even if people are speaking a, an entirely um, different language that I don't know, if anything sounds like my name, I react to that really fast. So do you think this kind of bias of like overfitting to our vocabularies is helpful for mutual intelligibility or it's making things harder? Or is it too, too, too big of a question? Um, I, I think it's an interesting question, um, but this would probably be more related to word recognition. So sometimes like if you don't understand a lot, but then there is one word that you really understand and then you become like, okay, I will just try to decode the meaning of the entire utterance from a single word. And then it depends if your guess is actually right, then that would actually help you. But if it's something like a false friend or something like this, you might completely miss the point. Um, but I, I see this as uh, something that is actually related to uh, word recognition in context. Yeah, but about the name, I am not actually sure that I understood your question here. Oh, no, I was just, uh, sorry, I was just giving that as an example of how we sometimes overfit to things and put so much priority on a particular uh, lexical items uh, that mm -hmm. uh, we just start sort of hearing them everywhere. And uh, it's, it's kind of just too dominant of a pattern. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if that could interfere with trying to parse something in a different language. Uh, yeah, but I don't know. It might actually be helpful, so I'm not sure. Um, so the task that you're focusing on is just identify what the language is and not try the, the, to... That, that would be the first one. Uh, the see. second one is more like a model of spoken word recognition. So um, it's, you know, that's, that's only one, uh, one task that I will, uh, I will present. Um, so I'm curious if the extra linguistic factors that you mentioned in the sociolinguistics part are things that you could actually model with a computational uh, model. So language exposure, yes, I agree. You can just train on just the one language, but the other ones are, I'm very curious about that. Uh, yeah, so I, I think for me, I'm going in the other direction. I want to actually not model <laughs> the extra linguistic factors, uh, but I see why that would might be actually useful for NLP work. So or like, yeah, for like uh, speech applications, that that might be interesting. But for analyzing cr cr cross language similarity, that might be a factor that we don't actually want to in, like to kind of include in our in our model. Yes, of course, I understand that this is kind of orthogonal to your work. I'm just curious if um, I mean this could be something that helps us learn more about. Yes. Uh, speech processing in humans, that's all. But uh, yeah, I mean, these were all my questions. Sorry if they're not particularly relevant. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'll ask more questions about your work I, I, once you get no, a chance no, I, to talk I more think, about that. I, I think it's relevant, uh, so don't worry about it. <laughs> um, are there any other questions from the audience? Um, looks like no, and there are no questions in the chat so far. Uh, so maybe uh, go ahead with the second part. Okay, so uh, welcome to the second part of the talk. <clears throat> uh, in this part, uh, um, in this part, I'll talk about uh, a case study on spoken language identification, uh, which is a straightforward task. So we have a spoken utterance uh, and auditory st uh, stimulus. 
and the task would be to uh, to guess or predict uh, the language of the speaker. And um, so th this is a task that also some humans are interested in. So we always like to kind of like think, oh, I, I'm just I hear some random speech, I guess. Um, they speak that kind of language. And there's actually a very cool paper that actually tried to analyze uh, exactly this. Um, so um, uh, this paper is about why are some languages confused for others. Um, so what they have done, they put an online game uh, for, uh, for people to play with. And the game was that um, the participant would hear um, a speech utterance of around 20 seconds. And then they would try to make a guess of uh, what language was that from uh, a few options. And as, um, as the participant gets uh, kind of like um, more and more correct guesses, the, 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 um, the game would become more difficult and then they would have to actually guess the language between uh, more like similar languages. So they put this, uh, they put and maintained this game online for a few years and they collected a lot of uh, judgments from the participants. And then they analyzed the, uh, the, the confusion matrix uh, they have obtained. And here we see that there are many interesting patterns. Uh, the first observation that it seems that there is some subjective kind of judgment that um, the two main clusters are kind of like West and East. So at, le at least the players were kind of like, um, uh, that would just, you know, guess this, this might sound more like an Eastern language. Uh, but some of these, uh, some of these patterns are, are actually kind of like correspond to our link, to our uh, linguistic intuition. So we see here all the Slavic languages, um, they are in a single cluster. So that's, this uh, actually shows that the participants were kind of like aware of um, what makes a Slavic language a Slavic language. And also the languages of India, um, regardless whether it's an Indo-Aryan or a Dravidian language, they also all clustered um, on a single group. So this shows that the participants were also aware of kind of like the, maybe the typological features of the languages of India across uh, the two main language groups. Um, so now, like we ask the question from a machine perception point of view, um, how do computational models of spoken language perceive cross linguistic similarity? And uh, do they capture more objective language similarity um, measures? So the kind of like measures that a linguist would think of, um, or do they reflect perceived language similarity? Um, something like that uh, we have seen with the uh, subjective, um, judgments about languages. Um, and for, for this, uh, we did a case study on the Slavic languages. Um, uh, so here we have, uh, we have a sample of 11 uh, Slavic languages from the three main uh, Slavic uh, branches. Um, so we have uh, three West Slavic languages and uh, three East Slavic languages and five South Slavic languages. And we know from social linguistic work that um, the Slavic languages are mutually intelligible to various degrees, but uh, the intelligibility seems to be higher uh, for languages within the same uh, within the same Slavic group. So, for West Slavic um, uh, for West Slavic speakers, uh, it's easier for them to understand other West Slavic languages compared to, for example, South um, Slavic languages. Um, and there are also, um, so this uh, three-way classification of Slavic languages is also based on phonological factors. Um, uh, but despite that, all of the Slavic languages have a lot in common in terms of their, uh, of their phonological features. So uh, all of them allow complex consonant clusters and they have also a rich consonant inventory. Um, so in this part of the talk, um, I will, present our work uh, on a spoken language ID uh, system based on a deep neural, um, based on a deep neural network. So I'll first present uh, what is this black box and then I will show some, uh, I will show a linguistically motivated, uh, motivated analysis uh, of the model. Um, so uh, for automatic spoken language ID uh, with deep neural, uh, 
uh, network. So we always start with a spoken utterance uh, that could be of a variable length. And this spoken utterance gets uh, kind of like, it, it, gets it gets projected with the segment level feature extractor into a single embedding. And this uh, segment level feature extractor could be something like uh, what we have done here, a, um, a convolutional neural um, network that would take a spectral um, representation of the spoken utterance and then project this into a, into a language, into a fixed dimensionality language embedding. And this language embedding then would go to a language classifier, which could be something like a multi-layer perceptron. And then we get a property distribution over the language space. And this uh, system is trained end to end with back propagation without assuming any symbolic representation of the input at any stage in the model. Um, and for the data uh, for this model, we train uh, on, so we, we have two sources or two data sets. One of them is broadcast speech and the other one is read speech. And the set of languages that exist in both data sets are only six Slavic languages. So we have Bulgarian, Croatian, Czech, Polish, Russian, and Ukrainian. And um, the utterances are quite short. So on average, they are like three seconds. And um, yeah, so we trained the model. Uh, so we, we, we trained the first model on the, on the, uh, on the broadcast speech and we do out of demand evaluation to uh, to assess the um, how robust the uh, the, uh, the model is with cross with cross domain variation so in this evaluation we look at the in domain samples so it seems that the model is working quite well uh, even for speech mm -hmm. samples that are one second uh, in uh, in a length and this is uh, the accuracy measure but here we kind of like uh, we become a little bit skeptical about this performance because even for one second one second utterances uh, it seems kind of like a bit high. So we did out of domain evaluation, and the the uh, the performance is not as impressive anymore. So it seems that the model is very sensitive to uh, just cross data set variations. Um, and then we thought maybe we should uh, we should explore this adversarial. Uh, adversarial domain adaptation str uh, strategies. So uh, what we want to do is to, uh, to use the target, the target domain to adapt the model. So we take only the segments from the red speech data, but without the labels. And then uh, this would, uh, would, uh, would actually help the model to kind of like transfer, to better transfer to the target domain. Um, so here uh, for this, um, domain adversarial training. So we have this part uh, the same as in the baseline model. And um, here we also have a distribution over the languages. This actually remains the same, but we add another head to the model that has to do uh, the domain classification task. And here the output is a distribution over the, um, the uh, domain. So this domain classifier head would actually try to predict whether the sample comes from the uh, from the broadcast speech or the uh, the other uh, speech, but we actually want this domain classifier to be very bad. So uh, we use the gradient reversal uh, layer trick in order to reverse the um, the uh, gradient signal. So here, this uh, this kind of like teaches the model to become invariant with respect to the data set that's actually used or the data set that the samples come. From, uh, uh, the samples that um, uh, come uh, come from. Um, so here, this is uh, kind of like a an illustration of the loss function. So this part of the loss function, it's the classification loss. So basically, we, we would like to minimize the language confusion, but at, at the same time, we would like to maximize the domain confusion. So the model should be very good at telling uh, which language the sample uh, is actually coming from, but not which data set the sample is coming from. And with this domain adaptation strategy, um, so we do the out of domain evaluation again, but uh, with the adaptive uh, model, and we observe uh, a high gain in the uh, in the uh, in the accuracy performance. So we get very close to the uh, to the in domain uh, to the in domain performance, even though the model did not actually observe any uh, any labeled samples in the in the uh, in the in the in the target domain. So only unlabeled sampled. Uh, 
only a label samples in the uh, in the target domain. Um, and then we also analyzed uh, the effect of the adaptation. So here we see that uh, the red points correspond to samples within uh, the uh, uh, within the same domain of the training of the training data, and the green uh, points are samples from the target domain. And then with the adaptation, uh, we see that the uh, the effect of the of this adversarial loss it makes all the uh, like in the points that be, that belong to the same language to cluster like an almost in the same like in point in space, um, regardless of whether it comes from the uh, from the red speech data or from the uh, broadcast data. Um, so this was the part where uh, to uh, to present the like system that we have done, and in, in this part I'll talk about the analysis that we have done to look into the emergent uh, representations uh, in the model. So we, we have used four different analysis techniques to look at this, uh, to look at this model. So the first one um, was a visualization of the language embeddings that have emerged in, uh, in the model. <clears throat> so we have replaced the language classifier here with a dimensionality reduction algorithm, the uh, UMAP, which will take every language embedding and project it into a two dimensional space so we can, uh, we can visualize it and look at it. And uh, UMAP is very similar to TSNE, but it tends more to preserve the uh, to preserve the uh, to uh, to preserve more the global structure of the space. Um, and these are the results of this of this uh, visualization. So here we see that the first observation that it seems that um, kind of like the model rediscovers this uh, three way. Um, grouping of Slavic languages into West, uh, East, and South Slavic. Uh, so this was only for the six languages that were used uh, during training. But if we also project the other five languages that were not observed during training, uh, we would see that they are actually grouped into their kind of like respective uh, cluster, even though the, the uh, so even though the model did not observe any single sample from these languages. Uh, during uh, during training, so uh, this shows that the model the, does not only discover some idiosyncratic features for every language, but it learns something that could actually uh, maybe a phonetic features that are that could generalize to other languages within the same uh, within the same group. Um, and then we kind of like took the average uh, the average language embeddings uh, for each language. So we have a centroid kind of embedding. And we did a uh, correlational analysis uh, with the uh, geographic distance. So here in the x-axis, we have the geographic distance in kilometers. And in the y-axis, we have the cosine, uh, the, cosine, uh, the cosine distance between the language embeddings. And every, uh, every uh, point in this uh, figure is, uh, so here we see, for example, for uh, for Croatian and, and Slovene, so the two uh, the two languages are spoken in two small uh, in two small countries next to each other. So we have a very small value of x, a very small geographic distance, and we also have a small cosine distance. And on the other hand, so we for Czech and Ukrainian, we have a a larger geographic distance and also a larger cosine distance. And if we if we uh, if we plot the other the other points, we observe a a significant positive correlation between the uh, geographic distance and the cosine distance. <clears throat> um, and this was quite nice. Uh, the other analysis that we have done, we thought we could it, could it could be also nice to look at the phylogenetic signal in these representations. Um, so this is a gold tree, kind of like reference tree for the, uh, for the phylogenetic grouping of the Slavic languages. And this is um, what we uh, what we have kind of the tree that uh, the re the reconstructed tree by uh, by applying uh, clustering analysis on the language on the centroid language embeddings. Um, so it seems that there is some phylogenetic signal, but here we see uh, there are two um, two languages that that were not actually that were not actually grouped in the right clusters. So uh, Bulgarian was grouped. 
uh, within the East Slavic languages and Slovak was grouped within the South Slavic languages. So even though it seems that there is some phylogenetic signal, but that might not be uh, the best predictive factor for the, uh, for the, uh, for the language embedding similarity. Uh, and then we asked the question then, what would be the factor that best explains the distance in the emergent language embedding space? And for this, we did a tree-based distance analysis because we don't have the underlying data points be, be, uh, of these underlying trees. Um, so if we compare this tree to uh, a bunch of randomly generated tree, and then we have taken the average, uh, we would get this value of 0 0.37. And then we compare this to uh, two other uh, phylogenetic tree from the uh, from the literature, <clears throat> and the first one, the uh, the one by Serva and Petroni. So this is a little bit kind of like con controversial uh, kind of grouping of into European languages, but we have taken only the Slavic uh, the Slavic branch from this, um, and it's not that high, but uh, in another kind of like classical lex uh, lexicostatic um, grouping of the Slavic languages, it's actually the distance is uh, more similar to that. And uh, it's also not far from the geographic distance, but it turned out that the best factor that uh, kind of like, um, that, is be, uh, that is reflected in this tree is the uh, is uh, from the confusion matrix of the Slavic languages in the great language game. Um, so it seems that the factor that better predicts the similarity in the language embedding space is the perceptual similarity uh, between, uh, between Slavic languages. So uh, this is the conclusion slide for the second part of the talk. Um, so it seems that deep neural networks perform very well in discriminating between related languages, uh, there might be some kind of like cross domain variability effects, but if we have the right, if we have the right data set and the right, uh, the right, the right training procedure, uh, we can actually do very well. And it seems like, uh, it, it, it also seems that the distance and the emergent language embeddings correlates with uh, both geographic and phylogenetic distance. But, um, uh, but from our from our analysis, it seems that the perceptual con confusability between the languages is the factor that best predicts the distance in the embedding space. So this would be the uh, the end of of part two. Uh, thank you very much. This is super interesting. Um, if anyone has any questions, again, feel free to raise your hand or post questions in the chat or just unmute yourself. Um, or there's also the link in the Rocket chat if you want your questions to be <laughs> preserved after the end of the Zoom session. Um, if no one's asking any questions right now, uh, maybe I can start. Um, I actually had a low level question first about your uh, train and test split. So you said that you had those two data sets, the broadcast and the red, and they both had only the six languages in them. So where does your test set come from? Because it seems like you have all the languages in there. Is that right? Um, um, are you talking about this result here? Uh, no, you are. Uh, yeah, so maybe I should just cl clarify this. So, so here the, the the test data for this come like this only has the six languages that are shared in both data sets, right? And then for this one, so this is this comes from the from the broadcast speech data set. So this is. Um, these these samples here are still within with n domain, but this is an analysis of this of the adaptive model. Um, these samples here were not observed at all, so not the languages and not the samples. Uh, so where uh, so how did you get those representations for say Macedonian, if you uh, if it wasn't uh, in your data set? 
I mean, that's that's why working with speech is, re is really good because you just need to take the speech samples and then you do like a forward pass through the model and then you get a representation. So it's it's not a fixed language embedding. It's, um, it's like for, for every speech sample, we get an embedding. And it's, so, uh, it's not something fixed. So we, we, we don't have an embedding matrix in this model. Uh, but that means you had speech samples for those languages that are not among the training six. Uh, only during the analysis. Yeah, I was just wondering where those yep. came from, like what kind of domain they were. And, uh... yeah, yeah, so they, for this analysis, all of them, they come from the broadcast domain. Oh. I see. Um, so uh, is there any reason why you did so when you did the uh, domain adaptation, you made the red speech your target domain. But if these unseen languages were from the broadcast domain, did you try going in the other yeah. direction? Yeah, so we, 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 we have actually more like results in our paper. So um, it seems that the adaptation is more promising in, when, in, 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 in one direction but it's not as good in the other direction. So w when we did this adaptation from the, um, from the from like if the source domain is the is the broadcast speech and the target domain is the read speech this actually works much better than the other way around the, the other way around the the adaptation is doesn't actually improve much and this has to do with the maybe the diversity of the speech samples so it's um, uh, the broadcast speech has more kind of like diversities. So the model gets to learn two skills. One is to isolate the language signal from whatever else in the speech. And the other one is to actually identify this, uh, the, um, the uh, language. And we wanted to see if the, if, if uh, this higher performance in the out of demand evaluation actually correlates with uh, our intuition of language similarity. Um, because in the other direction, since the accuracy was not that good anyway, it didn't make sense to uh, to look at these embeddings. I see. That's a very interesting result. I didn't expect that it would work differently in the two directions. Um, I actually have one more question, which is maybe more philosophical. So mm -hmm. you're saying that the goal of your analysis, uh, well, well, I guess one of the goals of your analysis is to disentangle the, you're trying to disentangle the phylogenetic similarity from the perceived similarity. And you're trying to see what kind of, which of those is going to be captured by uh, the computational models. Mm -hmm. But to what extent are they actually uh, disentangleable? <laughs> it, because no. I feel like it would, things that we use for perceived similarity are maybe some of those the historical linguists use them to reconstruct the phylogeny like maybe mm -hmm. the shared phonetic inventories of some languages maybe it's used as evidence that uh, you know these um, are in the same like come from the same branch of the tree or I, i'm just speculating i'm not a historical mm -hmm. linguist do you think that's a thing um yeah so actually both factors kind of like, as you have said, it's um, the, the phylogenetic grouping is based on phonological factors. Um, uh, but there might be more like surface features that kind of like differentiate these two. Um, I'm, I'm not like, I'm not, uh, so like for, for example, what, one of these could be vowel re reduction patterns in Bulgarian, uh, which kind of like could make it sound more like Russian or Belarusian because they also have strong vowel re reduction patterns. And this is kind of like more, it's, it crosses the language grouping. Uh, so it's like, it, it, it makes the South Slavic, I, I mean, if we look at it from a typological perspective, then it makes Bulgarian more similar in this aspect to um, to uh, to or to I guess Russian and Belarusian. No. Uh, yeah, that's uh, fair. 
of course, it's 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 not an easy problem. I, I and I and I think this is one of the well, one of the difficult tasks for historical linguists to distinguish uh, like you know, aerial features from um, from genetic features. It's not that easy. I see. So spe specifically, you're kind of looking at specifically cases when perceived similarity contradicts the phonological, for phylogenetic, sorry, similarity. Yeah. I mean, like for, for us, like the, the interest is more which factor can predict this representational similarity better. Got it. But I, I, I don't want to make any claims about these um, already existing established groupings but we have something and it could be explained by different things. Uh, and we will just, we just try, try to see which factor actually correlates more with this, uh, with this uh, representation of similarity. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, uh, that, that, makes, that makes perfect sense. Uh, that's, I think, a very interesting question to ask. Uh, which one of them better explains what we're capturing in those embeddings? Um, does anyone else have any questions? Um, it looks like no, uh, but please, uh, if there's anything, please feel free to post in the chat at any time. Um, would you like to go into part three? Yeah, sure. All right, so uh, welcome to part three uh, of this talk. Um, um, in this part, I'll talk about another case study that we have done uh, with, uh, with analyzing models of spoken word processing. Um, so there is a family of models uh, in speech technology um, that produce um, what some people call acoustic word embeddings. Um, and this is here, Different to the uh, to the to the embeddings that I have introduced in the first part, these embeddings actually do not correspond to languages, but they correspond to spoken words. So if we start uh, with the, uh, with one spoken word here, uh, we would have we would have an acoustic encoder. Uh, this could be a deep neural network, and it would project the spoken word into an embedding. And here, the spoken word could be in, of any length and the embedding would be of a fixed dimensionality. And uh, this acoustic encoder is, uh, is trained in such a way that um, it, should, it should predict this word into an embedding space where, um, where spoken segments of the same word type um, should, be, should be grouped together in this, uh, in this representational space. So here, the red, uh, all the red points correspond to the same word, uh, while the green points and the blue points, they correspond to other words. And of course, here, uh, it will be also ideal that uh, the distance in this representational space uh, could, also, um, could also correlate with the perceptual distance or with the word phonological distance. So the applications of these acoustic word embeddings are, um, uh, they are actually used in uh, query by example speech search. And this is a technology that's actually used when it's not possible to, uh, to use automatic speech recognition, perhaps because the language does not have a writing system or it could be because we have a, co a collection of colloquial speech uh, that's not standardized, uh, and it will be just easier to search directly uh, in the speech mo modality rather than the text modality. But we can think of it as a word level ASR. Um, but these models have recently been adapted or uh, has been, uh, they have been recently adopted as models of spoken word processing. Um, and uh, the, um, the task that they simulate is actually the lexical access or the lexical processing. So um, given an, an auditory stimulus, uh, the task would be to kind of like simulate the mental, uh, the mental uh, representations that get activated in response to this uh, stimulus. 
And they have shown similar um, kind of like behavior to human performance in some aspects, such as the onset bias. So uh, kind of like words that have the same onset would be more similar in this, uh, in this, um, in this representational space. And one of these models that are used uh, for, uh, for this, uh, for the acoustic word embeddings, it's called the correspondence autoencoder. And um, uh, this model actually does not assume any uh, discrete uh, phonological representations of the underlying speech data. And it's, um, it's actually trained on acoustic sub, uh, with acoustic supervision. So we start with a, um, we start with a spoken word in the input uh, this this would be a, uh, and then uh, we project this word into uh, into an embedding or into a representation X, and then there will be a an acoustic decoder that would try to reconstruct uh, um, another sample that corresponds to the same word type, and here I call it X plus. Uh, is uh, here I, I call it A plus. Um, so um, in every iteration uh, for every input, uh, the output will be kind of like sampled um, randomly. And uh, so in machine learning, they call this model the correspondence autoencoder. So it's uh, similar to the autoencoder that kind of like tries to reconstruct the same input, but the difference here, the output is not the same sample, but a sample of the same type as the input or the same class as, uh, as the input. And once the model, uh, once this model is trained, we only use the encoder and we don't use the decoder anymore. So as I have said, this is called the correspondence autoencoder um, and it only learns from speech, si uh, from speech signals. Uh, so with only acoustic supervision and it doesn't have access to any symbolic units such as phones or phonemes. Um, and it has been shown that this model predicts. Um, so if we, uh, this model has been uh, taken as a model of, uh, as a phonetic model of non-native speech processing. And it has been shown that it predicts some non-native lexical difficulties. Um, so the first one of these non-native speech processing uh, difficulties, um, uh, that is kind of like very, uh, uh, very well known in speech perception uh, research. Uh, which has to do with the difficulty of Japanese listeners to distinguish between uh, between uh, minimal pairs uh, that have the la ra phonetic contrast, um, and that's because in uh, Japanese the la ra uh, contrast is not linguistically uh, meaningful, so there are no minimal pairs that only differ in this contrast. Um, so this has uh, this. Difficulty has to do with the fact that for a Japanese listener, the la and ra would sound the same. Um, and this uh, correspondence autoencoder model has shown that it can actually predict this, uh, it can actually predict this processing uh, uh, difficulty. So here we see that uh, the, red, uh, the red bar here is a native Japanese model and the blue bar is an English, uh, is a monolingual English model. And in the y-axis, this is the error rate for, the, uh, for a discrimination task between minimal pairs such as lock and rock. And it seems that with more exposure to English data, the model gets better and better at this discrimination task. So it seems that this model can predict, um, can predict lexic lexical, um, lexical processing uh, uh, difficulties that are due to phonetic contrast or non-native phonetic contrast. Um, but this is not the only non-native processing uh, difficulty that uh, could actually happen. Um, so for uh, L1 English listeners, um, the, uh, there is some speech uh, perception study that showed that uh, native English listeners uh, could have difficulty in processing uh, non-native words such as the Russian uh, Malako and Malatok just because they are acoustically similar. Uh, but it's, this case is more interesting than the Japanese case because uh, the words Malako and Malatok, they are actually, there is no difficult phonetic contrast here. So it, all these phonemes actually exist in the English phoneme inventory. So this lexical, uh, this, this lexical processing uh, difficulty uh, cannot be attributed to the fact that there are some phonemes that just 
difficult to process for English speakers. But of course, it has to do more with uh, the fact that um, if the listener is not exposed to uh, a large sample of the lexicon of the other language, then uh, the words that are phonologically and acoustically similar would be uh, would be confusable. And um, and they showed that the correspondence of the autoencoder model could also predict this effect, although it's not as clear as the uh, as the non-native Japanese difficulty. So here with more, so it seems that the monolingual Russian model is better at this discrimination task than the monolingual English model. So here the question that we ask, okay, it seems that this is uh, a very promising phonetic model of non-native speech processing. Uh, and it, it shows that it can predict the lexical difficulties, but we kind of like wanted to go in the other direction and ask the question whether this model can predict the facilitating effect of language similarity on spoken word processing. And um, because we know from uh, some social linguistic work that uh, non-native sp uh, spoken words that uh, uh, could, become, uh, could be comprehensible to speakers of related languages if they are cognates or if they sound similar. And uh, for this, uh, we have kind of, uh, we, we looked at one case study of mutual intelligibility between the West and the South Slavic languages um, that uh, was done in 2015. So they have, uh, they have investigated several tasks uh, to measure uh, mutual intelligibility. And one of the tasks that they have investigated was the spoken word translation. So uh, for this task, uh, they, have, uh, they have compiled a list of words uh, very, uh, very frequent concepts, uh, and they have compiled uh, such a list uh, for um, uh, for for West and South Slavic languages. And then they asked people to come to their lab. Uh, so they invited some participants who are uh, who should be in uh, in principle uh, only monolingual speakers. Um, so here in this example, we have a Polish listener. And then they would ask them to listen to an audio recording of that word and check, and then uh, try to kind of guess the corresponding translation in their native language, which is in this case Polish. And um, for 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 translation uh, for translating the Czech words, uh, unsurprisingly, the uh, the group of participants that did very well on this task. So we, we can see the translation performance on the y-axis. The, uh, the Slovak participants did really good uh, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, translating the, uh, the, uh, the Czech words. Um, and the second group were the Polish participants. But then for the South Slavic languages, it seems that it's their, their, uh, their, their so they did not do as well on this task compared to the other West Slavic speakers or participants. And for tra for translating uh, the the, uh, the Polish words, we see kind of like a similar effect. So the participants who are native speakers of uh, of other uh, of another West Slavic language, they did better than the speakers of the South Slavic languages. Um, so like uh, this shows that. Uh, there is an advantage of being a speaker of West Slavic language when translating Czech or Polish words. Um, and this is, so here we could ask the question, why would anyone who doesn't speak another language would be able to kind of like, you know, guess what the words, uh, what that word is uh, when they hear it. And this is an example of the cross-language lexical access. Um, so here, if we start with the spoken stimulus, um, uh, so we can conceptualize this uh, this lexical access as a process that starts with the acoustic phonetic processing of the incoming speech signal, uh, followed by the the phonological decoding that will probably activate uh, that will probably activate some word form representation. But it could happen that this word form may not actually mean something in the uh, in the uh, in the native language of the listener. So they might hypothesize that. What the speaker meant could be another, uh, the uh, the uh, could be the nearest phonological neighbor to that word. And then once they have actually figured out which word it could actually mean, uh, they would just uh, they would just map it to uh, to the intended um, um, meaning here. 
Uh, and this, uh, this is a process that could be a bottom up process. So the individual uh, phonemes uh, kind of like inform this uh, kind of decision, but it also could be a top down process. Uh, so knowing what are the words that could exist uh, in the in in the uh, in the lexicon of that language could also help this uh, could also help the listener to decode what was the spoken word and here uh, we are more uh, we are interested in this acoustic phonetic processing front end of language processing and we think this the uh, the correspondence autoencoder model actually simulates this processing since there are no uh, there are no phonological or at least there are no um, uh, there are no explicit phonological uh, representations at any point in this uh, uh, in this uh, in this model <laughs> um, so now that the task becomes okay if we simulate an an, an auditory information processing task uh, can we uh, can we kind of like uh, can we predict the um, uh, the west slavic advantage when uh, when processing other West Slavic words. And here we uh, simulate listeners of seven different languages. Um, and uh, we use the global phone read speech data. So this, uh, this data set is cross linguistically kind of like comparable in terms of, uh, in terms of domain. And we also sample 42 speakers for each language. And we have around 32,000 acoustic segments that correspond to words. Uh, for each language, and here we focus. Uh, so we, here we uh, we train a model uh, for each language in this set, and the focus would be uh, uh, in the Czech Polish case, and we are more interested uh, also in the uh, uh, in the Slavic languages because here uh, they are more similar compared to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the other languages in this uh, in this set, and to analyze the emergent. Uh, representations in these models and also to um, uh, to look whether the models can predict uh, the effect of language similarity we apply the uh, we apply the representational similarity analysis to this uh, so the uh, or the uh, or the RSA framework which is a set of techniques to compare different black boxes based on their response to the same stimuli and this is a framework that has originated in neuroscience research uh, with the goal of uh, with 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 goals that are more kind of like related to uh, to the uh, to the objectives of neuroscience research to look at for example how the different regions in the brain uh, would actually uh, would actually respond to um, to to to, uh, to to given stimuli or to compare between the brain um, maybe the brain activity patterns to with computational models um and it works by first representing a set of stimuli in a feature space and then we compute the similarity or the distance uh, between the stimuli in this feature space and then we compare the similarity of similarities so it's a second order comparison uh, we don't compare the activity patterns themselves but we compare the geometry of the uh, of the representation of the representational spaces uh, in the different models or in the different brain regions um uh, but this technique has also been introduced into machine learning research recently uh, with the goal to kind of like analyze the similarities or the differences between different neural architectures um, and examine how the input representation changes uh, through the network layers as it, uh, as, it, uh, as it gets from the input layer to the output layer. Um, and here we use RSA to study the effect of linguistic experience uh, characterized by the training uh, of the language data. Uh, by the language of the training data. Um, so here to, to illustrate this with, a, with an example, so let's say that we start uh, with a single spoken word stimulus, uh, let's say from language A, and we use the model to represent this uh, spoken stimulus uh, with a vector. Uh, let's, say for, uh, let's say for this case, this, ve this vector X, and we use the native, the native model that was trained on the same language uh, to project the word into a representation. Um, and we do the same, but uh, we project um, the spoken word into a vector by a non-native model that was trained on language B. Uh, 
So here we have two different representations of the same word, but since they live in two different representational spaces, we cannot compare them together. But what we can do, we can uh, take a group of word stimuli and, uh, and uh, map each one of them into a vector uh, uh, using the native model and the non-native model. And then we can look at the, uh, how, um, how the two, um, how the two representational spaces uh, correspond to each other. So do they, uh, do they agree on how they actually, how they actually represent the words or do they make maybe different, uh, different projections for the same stimuli? And to do this, we use the central, uh, we, we, we use the centered kernel alignment technique, which is, uh, which has been shown to be invariant to isotropic uh, scaling and orthogonal, tra uh, orthogonal tra uh, transformation. And this would allow us to, to abstract away from the vectors themselves and look at the geometry of the representational space. So here we compare between uh, the representations of the native model to the representations of the non native model that was trained on language B. And we do the same, we project the same data points with another non-native model, let's say that was trained on language C, and we do the same thing. So here we get another similarity measurement, uh, kind of like another similarity measurement between the native model and another non-native model. And then we can uh, look at which model actually is more similar to the native model. Um, and this is like, the, so this is the common framework in, uh, in the uh, in the in the RSA research. So here, uh, when we look at uh, the check stimuli, so um, here we have uh, six different non-native models. So we first uh, we first represent the check stimuli by the check model, and we get a set of representations, and then we compare them to the representations of the other six models. So, for example, for German, we get we, we get this uh, similarity score, which by itself, it doesn't mean much. So we have to compare this to another similarity score by another model. And here for French and Portuguese, uh, we get kind of like similarity scores that not far from the German model, even though it seems that French is more similar to Czech for some reason that we don't know yet. Uh, but if we compare the Slavic models, uh, they seem to actually be more similar to the uh, to the uh, representations of this of the Czech model, and the model that agrees the most to the Czech model is the Polish model. And if we do the same uh, with the Polish stimuli, uh, we, we get also a similar effect. So the model that represents the Polish words uh, in a, in the most similar way to the native Polish model is the Czech model. And here, um, the numbers here might not look very different, but we have to remember that uh, these models represents the same input. Uh, and this input was not actually like you know, chosen with a challenging kind of criteria. So these words are words that are sampled from the Czech lexicon and they follow a Zipthian uh, uh, kind of distribution. So they're not meant to be challenging for the non-native models. And we see here that uh, this RSA analysis for the models uh, predicts the word translation task performance. So we do see the, uh, the West Slavic advantage here. Um, and this actually means that the cross-language acoustic phonetic similarity facilitates word level intelligibility. Um, so even though our model does not do a semantic task, but it can still uh, kind of like give results in the same direction. And when we look at the representational similarity analysis matrix, um, we see that this, so here uh, to, to the right is the clustering analysis on this matrix. And we see that uh, the, all the Slavic languages were actually uh, were actually grouped in a single cluster. And also something I was surprised by that uh, that Portuguese and French also formed their own cluster, even though um, uh, at kind of like the distance is higher than the Slavic language pairs. Um, but something that was surprising here is the case of Russian and Bulgarian. Uh, we expected Czech and Polish to be uh, the most similar language pair, but it seems that from the model's perspective, Russian and Bulgarian is the most similar, um, uh, the most similar language pair. Uh, and to look or to think a little bit about this case, uh, so the Czech-Polish similarity here is kind of expected, uh, given that we, we know that both are West Slavic languages that are mutually intelligible to a great degree. 
but the Russian Bulgarian similarity might be a little bit surprising. However, if we consider that, uh, so it's, it's, it's a bit more surprising because Russian is an East Slavic language while Bul Bulgarian is a South Slavic language. Uh, but if we consider word internal prosodic features and segmental reduction, uh, uh, we would kind of like uh, see that the lexical stress um, kind of like have um, uh, the lexical stress varies between these languages. So in Czech and Polish it's fixed. So in Czech, uh, the stress is always um, uh, is is always initial, while in Polish uh, it's always been ultimate. Uh, while for the Russian and Bulgarian, the stress, the, the lexical stress is free and uh, so it's it's variable. It could actually occur on any on any syllable uh, in the word. And um, the unstressed the unstressed vowels in Russian and Bulgarian are reduced, so there are like strong re reduction patterns in these two languages. Uh, and it seems that the model is sensitive to these re re reduction pattern. And this is what makes the Czech and Polish uh, models different than um, uh, Russian and Bulgarian. And also there is a strong contrast between stressed and unstressed syllables in the case of Bulgarian and Russian. Uh, and that's not the case for Czech and Polish. Um, so to summarize the finding from this RSA, uh, from, the, from the representational similarity analysis, uh, we saw that the RSA simulation kind of like predicts the West Slavic advantage when processing Czech or Polish stimuli. And since our models do not have access to semantic information or anything about the word meanings, um, this shows that the, uh, the, social, the social linguistic findings in terms of mutual inter intelligibility could also be attributed to acoustic, to, um, to kind of like similarities in low level acoustic phonetic processing and phonological decoding. So it's not only about the lexical similarities or the fact that these languages have a lot of cognate words, but it also has to do with the, uh, with the kind of like the low level front end of language processing. Um, yeah, so to, to, uh, to conclude uh, this like second part, we, uh, uh, I have presented a simulation on the cross-language lexical access using, a, uh, 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 using an acoustic phonetic model of spoken word processing uh, that was proposed in the literature. So we just added the analysis part. Um, and we show that the, uh, the RSA analysis um, uh, showed that the model predicts the facilitating effect of language similarity uh, on uh, on uh, lexical processing, and uh, and more than that, we sh we uh, we have seen that it seems that uh, the model is sensitive toward internal paucity and vowel re re reduction patterns, um, uh, and that's probably the reason why uh, Russian and Bulgarian seems to be the most similar language pair in this analysis. So this would be the end of part three. Oh, great, thank you very much. Um, does anyone have questions? Um, I'm going to ask a quick question. So uh, I understand that this is not, uh, this is a very exciting paper. I remember you presented it in a Black Box NLP recently, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm uh, uh, something that I haven't thought of before. I guess this doesn't apply to your method because it doesn't access the semantics in any way, as you said. But for the sociolinguistic study that you were sort of drawing on, I was wondering how the words were selected because there are, yeah. it's true that there are a lot of cognates, but also, you know, um, there is, I've definitely seen a lot of jokes about, um, I think most of them were about Russian and Czech, where the <laughs> same sort of form means a completely different thing in Russian and in Czech. And it's very easy to be fooled by, you know, the same pronunciation and the same, uh, uh, no. you know, the spelling module or the alphabet. So like, if you just use those words, 
you would get much worse results, right? If you deliberately give adversarial examples, or you mm. could make it really easy by giving non-adversarial examples. So I'm mm. wondering how. Uh, so in, in, in their social linguistic experiment, um, I think the words were chosen based on, um, on frequency. So what they have done, they have actually taken the most frequent words and the British national corpus, like the most 100 frequent words. And then they translated each one of them into the languages in their study. Um, and they did not take, uh, I, like, I don't know if they had a special thing for like, to, for the adversarial examples that you mentioned. Um, uh, but I think this also explains why in our analysis, it's it's more similar. So it, we, we get the direction of the effect, but not the magnitude, because we don't have any adversarial stuff here. So it's 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 all based on the on the word form representation and not on the meaning representation. But it would be interesting to compare this to a model that has access to semantics and see if there is uh, if we can maybe do an experiment with only these adversarial false friends. I think the adversarial ones aren't, I think there is an etymological connection. Uh, so they did evolve from, you know, the same root, but they ended up meaning the same form ended up meaning different things in the two languages. And uh, yeah, if you try to sort of translate it directly, you would most likely be by, be fooled by this similarity, but it's not, it's not a coincidence. So I guess it makes some sense. Uh, yeah. for them to be similar yeah. i mean this this also leads to the to the question how to represent this like semantic aspects in these models uh, i mean like my naive way of thinking of semantics is to use word embeddings um, and the question becomes do these words occur in the same context in these two different languages this will just tell us to if the if the contextual or the distributional neighborhood is the same, I guess. But I don't know if you have any ideas about how to represent meanings um, in these models, like a better way than just thinking about word embeddings. Uh, I, I would really like that. Yeah, I mean, I'll think about it. I can't <laughs> promise that I'll come up with anything salient. <laughs> but this is, as a speaker of a Slavic language, I think I'm really curious about this work and I think this is really exciting. Um, yeah. Any more questions about this part? Hello. Hi. <laughs> First, I have to excuse myself for being uh, late because I was assuming it would be, uh, you know, like 7 p.m. in our, my time zone. So I'm one hour late and I, <laughs> I'm sorry that I missed probably the most interesting, but I know a little bit the work and, and uh, I'm also happy, you know, to be able to discuss these things. And my question is about language similarity, right? So. So what you what you showed in the end is that this graph when you when you have you know that the similarity is like 0.7 for so you are looking at what well, one language like Czech and then you look at the similarity for other languages, yeah. Uh -huh. And so uh, here, so this is the similarity that you actually yeah uh, came up with uh, using your analysis, correct? Yeah. And yes. so for you, uh huh. Uh, right, and so for you, then uh, the, the question was, was, how come that the uh, Russian and um, and the Bulgarian are similar, right? But they are, they turned up similar using this error RSA analysis as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that was just wanted to uh, to see you know like um, uh, if there are other ways of measuring the language similarity. Yeah, so that's. Um, yeah. Because here you have, you know, like you say, okay, what's what is similar is what what ends up close in the in in your um, um, clustering hierarchical clustering, right? Yeah. So that's yeah, similar. Uh, and the yeah, effect. I mean this one. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. And so then the effect. That's the part that I missed. I'm sorry. <laughs> so. Um, so, uh, have, did we see uh, the effects uh, of the similarity on processing? You, you, you mean for the human experiments? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, they 
did not include Russian in the analysis because they only worked with the official languages of the EU. So they have Bulgarian. So I, I, I can go back to their um, translation uh, results. Uh, Thanks for being patient for this, but I'm very curious. Yeah, it's, 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 it's okay. So they did a spoken word translation task, basically. So uh -huh. here, um, so they, they have, so let's say for the Czech words, they have compiled a list of 100 words. And then mm -hmm. they asked participants who are speakers of other Slavic languages to try to, they, could, they would listen to a word and then they would try to guess what it actually means in their mm -hmm. own mother tongue, right? So, and then for this task, for the Czech words, um, the translation score, so uh, like in, is in the y-axis, and the, the group that did well, like the best on this task, were this, these, the, uh, the Slovak participants. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. And then, and then second was Polish, and then Bulgarian was there somewhere, but it's not as compared as Polish, right? Mm -hmm. And then for Polish words, the group that did the best were, were the Czech participants. And Bulgarian was not compared, like it's, worse mm -hmm. than, uh, I mean, they, they did not do as well as the West Slavic speakers. Mm -hmm. and, and here, so here we have Bulgaria, we can compare our results to this, you know. Okay, so basically what you can add is, you know, like the, so like a more find the information of what is actually similar and what is uh, not similar. Yeah, so here it's true mm -hmm. that, you know, we, we have some uh, sense that Slovak and Czech are very similar, but with your analysis, you can put a measure on that actually. Yeah. Is that correct? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I understood you correctly, but here, um, uh, since, since we, we only have Bulgarian, uh, we, we can come that. So that's, that's why here in this comparison, I only consider uh, like Czech and Polish words. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so here, like what we are actually m measuring is like, so we have two, uh, okay, like for, for each one of these bars, we have two models. Mm -hmm. we, have the, we have the native Czech model, and let's say we have the, uh, the, other the Polish, yeah, mm -hmm. the, like, you know, L2 model. And then we have a set of stimuli and then we kind of like get an embedding for every word in this set of, of stimuli by the native model and the non, uh, like, you know, L2 model. Yeah. And then we compare these two representations of the same stimuli to what extent do they actually agree? And this is what we see here. So these numbers here is what they actually they measure show the is, similarity between languages. Yeah? They show the, how much the, the stimuli are similar when you when you have a native versus non-native model. Yes, so it shows uh, how I was I was able to follow this. <laughs> no, I, I, <laughs> yeah, so this actually sh shows the extent to which the two models agree on how to kind of like represent these stimuli. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a measure of similarity between languages. Um, yes, in, in our case, between the models, but we would like to see to what extent this corresponds to our intuitions of language similarity. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> no problem. All right, any more questions? Um, if there are no more questions, would you like to go on to your concluding part, Father? Yeah, sure. Um, all right, so, um, okay, so welcome to the last part of this talk, uh, where I, I will talk a little bit about some challenges that we have with this kind of research and uh, some research questions that I find interesting. Um, um, so the first, a challenge that I would like to talk about is the fact that cross-linguistic comparisons using speech data are really, like they are very difficult to do and not trivial. Um, that's because in speech data, we have many, many, many dimensions of variability 
uh, that might interfere. So what we are interested in is the language dimension, but there could be other kind of dimensions where uh, might be some interference that we do not want in our data. Uh, so it could be something like the number of speakers because we train uh, we train different models and if one model is exposed to more speakers than another model then this could be uh, this could affect our uh, uh, our analysis um, and this is like something we always need to consider when we do any kind of cross linguistic work with speech data um, the second challenge is the fact that the speech data sets are kind of like noisy and not built with cross linguistic work in mind um, there are some exceptions, but they are still not ideal. Um, so one of the exceptions is the global phone data set, uh, which is a multilingual read speech data that has approximately 100 speakers per language. And this is the, uh, the data set we used in the second case study. And it was also uh, the target domain data set in the first case study. Um, so this data set was um, kind of like collected and recorded uh, with control recording environment and it has speaker annotations. So every utterance is associated with some annotations about the speaker um, and also some information or metadata about the speaker regarding the gender and the age. Um, and it's ortho orthographically tr uh, transcribed. That's how we were able to obtain this uh, spoken segments that corresponds to words uh, by applying force alignment. And, but it, it only exists for around 20 languages. So uh, the language coverage is not that great, but it's the best that we have uh, for this kind of research. Um, there is a new emerging data set that's keep expanding nowadays is the Mozilla Common Voice Speech. So it covers more typologically diverse languages, but it's a crowdsourced speech data. Um, so that means the recording environment is not controlled. So basically uh, every person is just recording with their own mic so the settings are not really that great and might vary across languages, uh, but it still needs to be validated if we could do a cognitively motivated cross-linguistic research with this kind of resource. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to talk about a few future directions that I really find interesting or a few research questions that we could address with computational modeling work that would help us a lot to understand some aspects of, uh, the, uh, of the human speech processing. The first one is, um, uh, why is mutual intelligibility not symmetric? Um, so for, for example, for um, like, we have a lot of kind of like um, some social, some social, social linguistic work as well as uh, informal observations kind of like suggest that Portuguese listeners seem to understand Spanish way better than uh, the other way around. Um, and this could be due to linguistic as well as extra linguistic factors. Um, but I think the main effect could be uh, due to phonological encoding and decoding. Uh, Portuguese has a much more complex uh, phonology compared to Spanish, as well as very strong re uh, kind of like phonetic reduction. And this could just make it hard for Spanish listeners to, uh, to decode what's being said in Portuguese. And Computational modeling can simulate unbiased listener and, and isolate uh, the, the uh, linguistic labels that we are interested in. Uh, here we, are, we, be, we would be interested in the acoustic phonetic and the phonological uh, labels. The second question that uh, would, be interested, uh, would be interesting to look at is why are some non-native phonetic contrasts more difficult than others. So here I uh, kind of like presented one case um, for uh, the uh, the processing difficulty for Japanese listeners when it comes to the la ra contrast, and that's because la ra are not in the in the so um, they, this this contrast is not linguistically meaningful in Japanese. Um, but the wa ya contrast is also kind of like has the same, um, has like a similar thing as the la ra contrast in Japanese. So there is no wa sound in German. Uh, the W in German is pronounced as va. And a lot of German speakers cannot produce the wa sound uh, if they did not study uh, maybe like an English and tried hard. Nevertheless, uh, in speech perception experiments, it seems that speakers of, or listeners, uh, so native 
So L1 German listeners can discriminate or can tell the difference between the wah and the yeah sound. Uh, and this has, this is probably due to the phonological abstraction. So the difference between uh, the yeah and wah sounds is the kind of like lip rounding. And it seems that the German listeners are very sensitive uh, to this acoustic dimension, uh, to, to this acoustic phonetic cue and the speech signal and it gets amplified. So that's why they can tell the difference. Uh, but that's, that still remains a hypothesis that could be, uh, uh, that could be simulated and verified using computational, uh, com computational work with controlled experiments. Um, the last feature direction that I think interesting uh, is regarding the lexical stress. Uh, and, and how it affects cross-language word segmentation. So in some languages, lexical stress is predictable, so it always comes in the same position, uh, but in other, it can vary. And uh, this means we could observe a, a different effect or the contribution of stress could be different uh, in these two cases. So speakers of languages with predictable lexical stress at, at word boundaries, so for, for example, French has uh, final stress and Czech has, in, has, uh, has has initial uh, stress. Um, so in this case, lexical stress uh, could have a role in the word segmentation. So it tells the, it tells the listener where the words actually begin and end. Uh, but languages with variable lexical stress, um, in, uh, for, for them, the lexical stress could be more informative for word recognition and not word segmentation. And this kind of like, it, it, would, be, it would be interesting to look at this from a computational perspective and simulate these experiments. Uh, so to conclude this talk, um, in the first case study, I've shown an analysis of the emergent representations in deep neural networks for spoken language ID. Um, and we showed that uh, they kind of like uh, uh, correspond in some ways to our linguistic intuitions. Um, uh, and in, this, in the second case study, I showed that the representational similarity analysis framework also when it comes to simulating the acoustic phonetic processing uh, for word recognition also uh, captures some cross, cross linguistic similarity uh, that corresponds to our uh, to our and to our uh, to our intuitions and um, uh, so the last thing that uh, seems that working with deep neural networks could provide a very promising framework for modeling the impact of linguistic experience on speech perception. And here we only tackled one aspect of linguistic experience, which is uh, the kind of like the native language or the effect of L1 on how we process and perceive speech. Um, so thank you a lot uh, for being here. And this would be the end uh, of my talk. Uh, thank you so much, Butter, for a very exciting talk. Uh, Oops, sorry. Let's give our speaker a round of virtual applause. Um, and uh, does anyone have any final questions or comments? Maybe I can just say that I'm really sorry I was so late, but that's really, really <laughs> interesting work. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, I, I think I think the talk is recorded. So, um, and then if yeah, you yeah, any, yeah, I will I will catch up. Yes. <laughs> yeah, if you have any further questions, you could write you you could just write to me an email and you know. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks. No problem. Um, yeah, it was great to have you here, Butter, uh, and uh, learning about your work. And, uh, if there are no more questions, uh, maybe we should close because we're a little bit over time. Uh, but thank you all so much for coming. And again, thank you, Butter, for presenting uh, your work today. Yeah, thanks for having me here. It was great. Bye-bye. Yeah. Always a thanks, pleasure. Guys. Bye. Bye.